You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 148, The Winter War Part 6, The War in the North. This week, a big thank you goes out to Raymond, Ronald, Brian, and Preston for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members, and to Max for the donation. You can find out more about either option at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. Throughout December 1939 and into January 1940, there would be fighting in many areas of Finland north of Lake Ladoga. The last two episodes has discussed some of this fighting, and this episode will look at some of the other fighting that would happen in this area before the focus of next episode shifts back to the major fighting that would happen on the Isthmus. One of the disclaimers I'll give at this point, and really this goes for the entire podcast, is that this is not an exhaustive discussion of all of the fighting that would occur in central and northern Finland. There were countless small engagements and raids and battles fought during the war, and to look at each of them in any detail would be an entire podcast. I've pulled out a few sections of the fighting for a more detailed examination in this episode, just to give you an example of what was happening. Along the front north of Lake Ladoga, there were a large number of smaller actions that would take place that would never be as famous as the actions like Suomasalmi. One of these would take place in the same areas that we discussed back in episode 4 of this series, although in the same area in this case still meant that it was quite separated by the geography of the area. In this case, two regiments of the 12th Finnish Division would defend the areas on the approaches to Suyarvi, against a much larger number of Soviet attackers. As longtime listeners know, I love a good armored train, and I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that this area of the front had an armored train, and it would once again sort of make an appearance in the fighting for a pretty lengthy period of time here. In this case, the train was very old, dating back to the Civil War days, but it had several machine guns and even some French 75mm artillery pieces. So, it, it did have some impact when it was firing sort of on the Soviet advances. It would move from place to place to try and slow down the Soviet attack as they approached Suyarvi. The defense of Suyarvi would last for a few days, and the last defenders of the village would pull back on December 2nd, after giving really their all to try and defend the city as long as possible, but it was impossible to hold it forever just due to numbers. On this area of the front, these troops were able to quickly retreat and break contact with their Red Army pursuers, and their commander, uh, General Titanen, of the 34th Regiment, would begin to put in place his plan to put a more permanent stop to the Soviet attack. As with so many other Finnish commanders, Titanen knew this area well, and he understood, much like other Finnish commanders in the weeks that would follow, that if the Soviet forces stayed on the roads, there would be opportunities for slowing or even halting their advance if the Finnish troops could properly position themselves in the surrounding countryside. Tietnan's plan was not to focus his forces on the road itself, and instead only a screening force would actually be positioned to stop the Soviet advance. Instead, he would move all of his forces in the areas along the road, which were almost certainly not navigable by the Soviets because there were so many unmarked paths and just general geography was a problem. And so an attack from this area was likely to come as a surprise, because the Soviets didn't know how to get around it, so maybe they would assume that the Finns didn't either. He would then send his men into an attack, catching the Soviets off guards and hopefully shattering their advance and pushing them back. This was an objectively good plan, that properly took advantage of all the strengths of the Finnish troops and their commanders, as would be shown in other actions like Suomasalmi and others. But it also meant that the Red Army would advance even further than it already had. During these early days of the war, before the full scope of the challenges that the Finns would face north of Lake Ladoga were fully known to Mannerheim and others at Finnish High Command, they were pushing for a more immediate counterattack. They didn't really fully understand how disadvantaged they were in the north, and so they assumed that they could just launch counterattacks to stop the Soviet advances. The problem was... This counterattack not just disrupted Tietanen's plans, but also it was going to be a major problem for his units, who had been fighting for over three days without a break, and part of Tietanen's plan was to try and build in some time to rest before the attack was launched. He was going to position his men, let the Soviets continue their advance while his men rested, and then boom, that's when he would launch his attack. However, with his new orders, 
This simply would not be possible, and Tietjen began to try and call Mannerheim's headquarters to get the counterattack orders rescinded, but he would be unsuccessful. And since he had his orders, all he could do was try to get his men together and then launch an attack up the road into the Soviet units. This was, of course, the worst possible thing to do, and when the Finns moved forward, they were met with withering fire, including fire from Soviet tanks. Just like other units, the two regiments in this area of the front were not accustomed to dealing with Soviet tanks, and that combined with the Soviet firepower from other sources like artillery and machine guns meant that the counterattack was a non-starter. Instead, the Finns would be forced to rapidly retreat, and they would not stop until they reached the Kola River at which point they were able to finally dig in, get some anti-tank guns into position, and prepare some defenses. To be clear, calling Kola a river might be doing a disservice to rivers everywhere, as it was never more than a few meters wide. But regardless of its size, the Kola River would be the site of Finnish defenses in this area for the rest of the war, something that nobody would have ever planned. It was just the spot they retreated to that looked good. Kola would turn into a months-long battle of attrition, although it would at least start with a few days' rest as the Finnish retreat had outpaced the Soviet advance. All available resources were put into supporting the new defensive line, with a motley crew of artillery pieces of all different types brought in to support the defense. This included that old armored train, which would once again put its French 75s to good use. The first Soviet attacks would be quite clumsy. They would fire their artillery, and then they would just come charging up the road right into the Finnish positions. The Finns would answer with their own artillery, maybe hit some of the tanks with anti-tank guns, and then use their machine guns to fire at the infantry until eventually the tanks would grind to a halt, then the unsupported infantry could not advance further by themselves, and so the whole attack would collapse. It did not help the Soviet cause that with every attack, more of their tanks were disabled, and those disabled tanks blocked the roads and highways even more. This would cause the attacks to spill out on either side of the highway to a greater and greater distance. Both sides would then spend the next month pouring more soldiers into the fighting on the Kola, and what started as an engagement of a single Finnish regiment versus a Red Army division would quickly expand into two divisions and two regiments, and then four divisions. The Red Army would also bring in all of its strength into this fighting, bringing in hundreds of pieces of artillery to pound the Finns into submission. The week of January 21st was particularly bad, with 200 Soviet guns balanced against just 20 Finnish artillery pieces. But no matter how much artillery they dropped on the Finnish positions, the Finns continued to resist. Wave after wave of Soviet infantry would attack, they would be killed, sometimes at great cost to the defenders, sometimes at very little cost. After those large attacks in the third week of January, the fighting on the Kola began to diminish in intensity, mostly because the focus of both armies had simply shifted elsewhere. Fighting would not fully end on the Kola, though, until the conflict was finally over, and on March 13th, when the ceasefire took effect, both sides were still holding their territory on both sides of the river. One of the options that the defense of the Kola opened up for the Finns was a counterattack opportunity just north of Lake Ladoga. In early January, Mannerheim would actively push the local commander, General Hagland, to attack quickly, eventually sending a representative from his own headquarters to expedite the planning and launching of the attack. Mannerheim was impatient for the start of the attack because he felt that the Red Army was presenting an opportunity on the northern side of Lake Ladoga. Before the end of the year, the Soviets had sent a lot of troops to various areas north of the lake, and there were some very tidy Finnish victories against some of these attacks, which we've already discussed. Kola was still holding out, the Finns had won a moderate victory at Toltyarvi, and then of course the fighting at Suomasalmi was going very well. This was combined with some of the challenges that the Soviet forces were having just north of Lake Ladoga, especially around supplying their troops, with the broken terrain and huge snowdrifts being a serious problem, and forcing the Red Army to stick firmly to their roads again. I'm sure you can see where this is going. The overall plan was not that much different than what had happened at Suomasalmi, where the main Finnish forces would be split into two different task forces, each with the goal of attacking a stretch of the Uma road. Just like at Suomasalmi, the goal was not to attack the main Soviet forces head-on, but instead to simply cut them off from their supplies. The hope was that this development would cause the Soviets to begin a series of hasty, ill-planned, and poorly executed counterattacks 
that would accelerate the collapse of the pockets that would be created as part of the attack. This was important to finish planning, because if it did not happen, and the pockets turned into a slow attritional grind, these operations would occupy a large number of Finnish troops for a lengthy period of time. It would also consume valuable ammunition, and it would of course cost lives. There had been a preview of what would happen in some of the pockets at Suomasalmi, where the fighting had drug on for many days, as the Soviet forces decided to just defend their place rather than try and break out. The attacks began during the first week of January, and on the 11th, the Finnish forces had already broken the 168th division in multiple pockets, and had completely severed the division from the supplies that were coming from the east. There would be 11 pockets in total created during the attack, some of which contained hundreds of tanks, which were a problem. These tanks were primarily from the Soviet 34th Tank Brigade, which had been part of the advances north of Ladoga. Fuel became a problem almost instantly for these vehicles, but even after they were out of fuel, the tanks still continued to play the role of fire support for the Soviet defenders, just adding to their already large advantage in firepower due to the artillery and mortars that were also trapped in the pockets. This would set up a situation where the Soviet forces could not really move due to the strength of the Finnish roadblocks, but the Finns could not make any real effort to reduce some of the larger pockets due to the firepower and manpower disparities that were at play, with the Soviet artillery quickly being called in against any Finnish attacks. Slowly, the smaller pockets were destroyed, but the three largest remained, near the village of Sira, Uma, and Katala. The Soviet forces at Katala were by far the strongest, and there would be a serious effort to find a way to supply the troops that were in within the pocket. The Finnish defenders were overstretched, trying to contain the entire pocket, and therefore there would be multiple instances where Soviet supply routes could be established to bring supplies into the surrounded Soviet units. Some of these were overland routes, which simply took advantage of the thin nature of the encirclements, while others were also established over the frozen surface of Lake Ladoga, which by mid to late January was able to support heavy supply runs. In both cases, the Soviet supply columns would use the cover of darkness to make their way into the pockets. Finnish ski troops would ambush them and try to whittle down the volume of supplies, but there was only so much they could do, and some supplies would always get through. When the weather permitted, there would also be some airdrops of supplies into some of the largest pockets. Now, all of these efforts to supply the Soviet forces did not completely solve the problem, and eventually the trapped Soviet troops would have to resort to eating their horses, but they were able to continue to resist. As the fighting continued, efforts would be made to relieve the pockets, efforts that would eventually be successful. Even with the reinforcements that had to be sent to Haglin near the end of January, the entry of fresh Soviet forces into the fighting, pushing west to relieve the pockets, finally resulted in the three remaining groups of Soviet troops being relieved. In the end, the fighting north of Lake Ladoga would be a failure for the Finns. They had some flashy early successes in the fighting, but by allowing the few pockets to remain and become quite large, they were unable to reduce them in time. Some credit should also be given to the Red Army commanders in this region. The 168th Division commanded by General Bondarev would find itself cut off in various pieces, but the commanders inside the large pockets would choose the correct path of just trying to hold out, instead of wasting their strengths on fruitless counterattacks. Basically, they did not panic, and that would allow them to eventually be victorious. For Mannerheim and the wider Finnish cause, these battles wouldn't just be a failure, they would kind of be a disaster. One of the reasons for the attack was to quickly destroy the Soviet forces north of the lake, so that the flow of Finnish troops could be reversed. Since the start of the war, thousands of Finnish troops had been moved north from the General Reserve to deal with the various Soviet offensives north of Lake Ladoga. Mannerheim really needed that flow to reverse so that some of those troops could start coming back to the Isthmus, where the fighting was rapidly escalating and the situation for the Finns was dire. Instead of reinforcements moving south, though, the prolonged action around the pockets meant that more troops had to be sent to Haglin, pretty much completely defeating the purpose of the attack in the first place. This fighting stands as a good example of how sometimes partial victories are not victories at all. The Finnish troops had executed a great early attack against the 168th Division. They cut it into multiple smaller groups, but because they could not take the next step, 
it might have been better to have never started the attack in the first place. One of the themes of the fighting north of Lake Ladoga that has occupied the last few episodes of the podcast was the shock felt by the Finnish leaders that the Soviets were sending so many troops into these areas to fight over largely unimportant terrain. But nothing would be more of a shock than the four offensives mounted in the very far north. These offensives targeted various villages and areas in the very far north like Petsamo, which was Finland's only Arctic port. They were able to capture the port with almost no fighting, and after a short firefight, they were able to bring in more forces by sea. The defenders of these areas had no hope of actually stopping the Soviet advance, and instead all they could really do was try and slow them down a bit, and then fall back to survive to fight another day. But as the Soviets then tried to push further west to capitalize on these gains along the Arctic Highway, they became vulnerable to the same type of raids that had been launched against Red Army formations throughout northern Finland. They became strung out on the highways, and this allowed Finnish units to launch raids, which forced the Soviets to devote more and more resources to defending the roads, including the building of blockhouses which were erected at five-mile intervals throughout January. Then by the end of January, the weather had deteriorated to the point where neither side could launch any serious military operations, simply due to the cold. In the end, these efforts would mostly just represent a major misuse of Red Army soldiers, with 10,000 troops mostly immobilized in far northern Finland with little ability to influence the fighting in the south. Now, while the Red Army would experience many challenges, like the fighting in the far north during the Winter War, the Red Air Force would have its own share of problems. Unlike on the ground, the problems in the air had little to do with Finnish resistance and were more about the Soviet aircraft being unable to have the impact they thought they should have. Around 2,500 aircraft would participate in the fight against Finland, with the bombing force being seen as the most important piece of the Soviet air effort. They would launch bombing raids against a variety of targets, ranging from direct attacks against Finnish military units to attacks against transportation systems like railways and railway stations, as well as against civilian targets. During these raids, the primary Soviet bomber was the Tupolev SB-2, a twin-engine bomber that could carry about 500 kilograms of bombs and was roughly comparable to many other twin-engine bombers that nations entered the Second World War with. The challenge in all of the cases was that Finland, in general, is a pretty spread-out nation. There were not large concentrations of targets just due to the structure and population distribution within Finland. And this meant that bombing raids against rail depots, for example, might actually just mean bombing raids against tiny little villages that had built up around the depots. But due to the difficulties of hitting targets while bombing, these tiny targets might necessitate multiple large bombing raids that tried to saturate the target with bombs in the hopes that some of them would hit the correct area. That's how hard it was to bomb a specific location. In many cases, even when the Soviet bombers got lucky and a bomb did hit the correct target, the damage was largely superficial and the trains would be running again within a matter of a few hours. Now, you may be getting tired of me saying this, but I will say it many more times. But this is once again just another example of how hard it was in the late 1930s and into the Second World War to really execute an effective strategic bombing campaign against targets like railways. During the war, even later in the war, when massively larger bombing fleets would be wandering around the skies of Europe, targets like railways would still prove to be remarkably difficult to put out of action. And so the Soviet failures to achieve the results they were hoping for is really just a great example of how hard it was during these early war years. For all of their effort in bombing industrial and transportation targets, the estimates for how many man-hours of military production were lost are as low as 5%, which was completely compensated for by the shift to around-the-clock production in many Finnish industries after the start of the conflict. However, just because the bombing of Finland did not achieve the goals that the Soviet leaders were hoping does not mean that it did not cause damage and suffering, with that suffering being most acutely felt by Finnish civilians. 
There would be over 2,000 instances of Red Air Force bombers striking civilian targets during the war, destroying 2,000 buildings and damaging 5,000 others. Along with this damage, 650 civilians would be killed and around 2,000 wounded. It was a modest death toll compared to later bombing campaigns, but at the time that it occurred, the bombing of Finnish cities would be one of only a handful of sustained bombing campaigns against civilian population centers. There were, of course, efforts by the Finnish Air Force to defend against the air attacks launched against targets in Finland, but from the very beginning they were at a massive disadvantage. At the start of the war, there were just 48 fighter planes that were flight-ready, and while more would be imported during the war from various European sources, they would always be at a major numerical disadvantage. To make matters worse, many of the fighters that were present were outdated and obsolete, with the Dutch Fokker D-21 being the only real modern fighter in the arsenal, and even that had a fixed undercarriage. Many reinforcements arrived later in December in the form of 30 French Moraine Saulnier 406s and 30 British Gloucester Gladiators. The French fighters were definitely better performing, with the Gladiators being an, an aging biplane design, which was less of a problem than the fact that their only armament was, was four 303 caliber machine guns, which made it difficult to cause real damage to Soviet aircraft. Even with their numerical and technological disadvantage, Finnish pilots would shoot down around 240 Soviet aircraft, although that probably says more about the vulnerability of bombers to attacking fighters than that the Soviets were unskilled or doing something wrong. There were also attempts to launch offensive bombing raids using Bristol Blenheims and some Italian Fiat bombers, but these bombing raids were always very, very risky due to the sheer number of Soviet fighters that they often encountered over their targets. This meant that most Finnish bombing raids were done as early or as late in the day as possible to minimize the amount of time spent over their targets during the middle of the day when interception was the most likely. Even when they managed to survive, causing damage was just as much of a problem for the Finnish bombers as it was for the Soviet bombers. Along with the active defense in the air, there were also attempts to make the anti-aircraft guns that defended Finnish cities as effective as possible. This included a system of air spotters at air raid warning posts, which were sighted in tall towers near likely targets, which proved uh, to be effective in providing some early warning, although it also put the spotters at risk of strafing attacks from enemy planes. Many of the spotters would be women, who replaced men in these areas who were needed at the front. Although Finnish anti-aircraft guns shot down over 315 Soviet aircraft during the war, which would put a serious dent in many Soviet bomber squadrons, they couldn't really prevent the bombing campaign entirely, nor could they impact the Red Air Force enough to really change the course of the war. I think the air war over Finland during the Winter War is a really good example of how an air force like the Red Air Force in this case could both numerically and technologically be so far above the defending air force and the defending air defense systems and still find it difficult to really have a huge impact. You know, it was, it's, it was proving much harder for air forces to really impact the courses of campaigns than what had been expected uh, at this point in the war or what had been expected sort of looking forward from the 1930s. <laughs> 